everybody. My name is Susan Smith-Peter, and I'm a professor of history here at the College of Staten Island. I'm also the director of the Public History Program, and I want to welcome you to our video, Lockdown Staten Island. I want to tell you a little bit about how it came about. Back when the pandemic began and lockdown had just begun, I decided to get together a bunch of our students. We have an MA program and also a public history certificate. And the students were feeling a little bit scared and a little bit isolated. And so we decided to get together on Zoom. And as a result, what happened was that the students were able to share their stories uh, and tell each other what they were experiencing in. Uh, then and some of them enjoyed it so much that they expressed to me that they would really like to have a place to do this in a more permanent sort of way and so as a result we created a Facebook page and we called it the CSI Public History Coronavirus Chronicle Facebook page and we collected material not just from students at the College of Staten Island but also from members of the Staten Island community and uh, over time, it became more well known, and the Museum of the City of New York actually chose seven of the items that we had out of 20,000 submissions for their exhibit, New York Response, which was uh, created right after lockdown ended. And uh, then after that, I was chosen to be a recipient of the John J. Markey Fellowship, and that was a great honor, and I appreciate that from the College of Staten Island. And as a result of that, I was able to hire a research assistant, the wonderful Melissa Cipolletti. And she has been a tremendous help for me uh, in this video and in other ways. Um, and what we did is we decided to branch out to work with the Journal of the Plague Year. Now, the Journal of the Plague Year is a nationwide journal, uh, a nationwide public history project. And what they're doing is they're collecting material from communities across the country and actually around the world as well. And um, our material uh, under Lockdown Staten Island is, is one of those. And we have decided to continue to collect the material and we have collected enough to have this video, this documentary that we want to welcome you to uh, right now. And I thank you and please enjoy the documentary. What I can say about disorientation and how to relate to um, my story about COVID, I remember it was um, March 11th, 2020. You know, it was a usual day. Um, I ran a club meeting, you know, on that Tuesday. But when I heard the news about that we would be getting kicked out of CSI and to go online for majority of the semester, I was completely shocked about that and the reason being that because no one really knew what was going on I mean we knew about the virus but we didn't think or me particularly didn't think it was becoming this big so it affected me mentally because I like so used to like going on campus you know seeing friends going to class you know having that flow you know, that workflow that I've always had. Um, but it really um, hurts me a lot. Honestly, I was never expecting the day I was getting my braces to be the last Friday I will ever see my friends. Fear during the COVID-19 pandemic, during lockdown. I'm at the beach, um, which is a place I would go to often. Um, for a walk during lockdown because 
you could be distant from people, um, safe, and feel calm uh, along the shoreline of Staten Island. And that was something we really needed in 2020 because the news was so scary. Um, people were dying at really scary rates. The news was full of numbers of casualties, um, of people who had passed, people who had been infected. And we weren't really sure how we could be infected. Um, we were wiping down groceries and sanitizing our hands, masking, unsure whether to spend time with family members or to stay away, to miss um, important milestones um, for fear of giving, of having and giving COVID to a loved one, um, but also for then missing that event. Um, we feared for employment, for stable employment. Many people lost their jobs during COVID-19, especially during 2020. Um, at my job, we were fur furloughed, but we didn't, um, we managed to stay employed, all of the people who worked there, um, but many weren't as lucky. So you feared for resources um, and that you would be able to maintain your lifestyle and take care of your family. Um, you feared for the political climate and realities. Um, misinformation was spreading. People were not eager to believe that masking was important or that social distancing was important in order for to prevent um, more people from catching COVID-19 and potentially dying from it. So there was a lot of disbelief and you found out even people in your social circle um, were believing things that could be really harmful to them. So um, there was a lot to be afraid of, but there was also um, lots to find hope in, whether it was talking with um, friends or loved ones on through technology or meeting for a socially distanced walk at the beach um, where I am right now. Uh, 2020 was a, a year of complex emotions and fear was certainly among them. Thanks. Hi, my name is Farouk and I would like to share my personal experience of fear that I felt during the surge of the pandemic three years ago. I remember one day at the end of March 2020, I was passing by the hospital building in Brooklyn. And uh, behind that building, I noticed a few track trailers standing there. One of them was a mobile refrigerator or refrigerated track. The one that I saw in the media that kept COVID victims as dead human bodies. Yes, what I've seen was exactly the one. I stopped immediately and the fear filled me all over. It was a feeling that we all will die from this plague. All of a sudden, I recall my friend's story who worked in another hospital in Brooklyn. He told me the horror he witnessed, like how too many patients arrive with COVID in his hospital and they just die in big numbers every single day. Around the middle of March 2020, my undergrad school pushed all students and faculty to an immediate break while the college administration was figuring out how to transform in-person classes into online ones. Meanwhile, I was thrown into the new reality of COVID-19 lockdown in New York City. As a part of it, there were empty shelves in supermarkets and grocery stores. In the first days of the officially declared lockdown, supermarkets became rapidly overcrowded by New York residents who had to rush to buy essential food supplies that could be preserved for a long time. The atmosphere of mass panic at the beginning of the pandemic and lockdown 
seem to be everywhere in New York. Hence, supermarket shelves naturally turn into aisles with wiped out shelves. Besides essential foods, toilet paper, and disinfecting products, sanitizers and wipes also ran out the speed of light. I made a joke once in my conversation with a store employee that I should have a time machine to travel to the recent past and buy all needed things and return. Supermarkets management decided to limit the sales items to avoid the absolute lack of necessary products in their stores. I could never imagine seeing such a lack of necessary food products in an economically advanced country like the United States. An issue I didn't think was going to be much of a problem during the lockdown part of the coronavirus pandemic was the issue of scarcity. Um, It really didn't hit me how bad the situation was until um, it was that period in between schools being closed, but places were still open. Um, So, for instance, my job, um, I worked at the Staten Island Mall at the time. Um, We were still open, but we were going to be closing within the next few days or weeks or whatever it was. Um, So things were still open, but we were for sure going to go into a lockdown period. Um, So I decided to go to ShopRite to pick up some things for that two-week closure period just to make sure that uh, myself and my family had enough to get by for those two weeks. We didn't have to leave the house, worry about it. Um, And then it would, everything would just go back to normal. Um, But when I had gone to ShopRite, um, what I saw shocked me. It was, it felt like the, that Thanksgiving week rush of everyone trying to buy their groceries for the holiday, um, except with a lot more panic and a lot more rush. Um, And the shelves were just completely empty. Um, I think the only things I was able to grab was a few boxes of pierogies and a few boxes of Eggo waffles. Living during the plague is like living in wartime. There's a lot of panic and people are scared of the idea that they can catch something just by standing close to another person. I've been reading a lot of things about the virus, social distancing, distance learning. It's it's all basically telling people to stay home. I've been in the house since March 15th. I left the house four times since. I went to work on March 15th and lost my job three days later because of the virus. I have a volunteer position at the radio station. I haven't done a single broadcast since March 13th. Actually, I was the last person on air before we got the notice that school wasn't allowing students on campus anymore. I wake up every day at 10 or 11 a.m. I read news about the latest numbers. I also grab a snack before I do some reading for class. I've been taking a lot of walks outside and obviously keeping my distance from people. My goal on taking these walks is to reflect on the good things I have. The, my health is uh, one of them that I am scared of losing because I have asthma and so this makes me very fearful that I can get the virus. It's very frightening. I also take these walks to remind myself that it's spring.
has been pulling me down terribly, but overall as an introvert and as someone who pretty loves isolation at this moment, it's not really affecting me on a home level since I see my sister, my parents, my grandparents all the time. It's not really affecting me in that way, but from seeing some of my friends, from seeing some of my sweet, lovely teachers, it's been rough. It has been a rough time. And yes, I have known people that have COVID-19. Some died and some are treated. I know a, a man who had COVID-19, but now he's much better than before. He's back on track, he's doing excellent. And I just wanna thank God for that because a lot of people wish they had their lives right now. And I'm pretty sure we wish our close ones and our loved ones and our friends and family members are all doing okay during quarantine. At the, um, at the start of the pandemic, as everything was locking down, um, I was working at a discount store on South Avenue. And because of that, I was considered an essential worker because we were selling food and health supplies and stuff that people needed. And frankly, I was the only one in the house working because everybody else was either let off or furloughed like my, uh, like my dad. He, um, <clears throat> we struggled for a while to keep everybody safe because I was still actively working, still actively being around people, but we were taking precautions to try to make sure we would be okay. Like obviously the masks helped a lot, but I also made sure to go out of my way to walk to work instead of taking the bus because it was ultimately safer and we didn't live too far. And ultimately we ended up pulling through it <laughs> despite a, having to deal with unemployment, which was kind of hit or miss. The fact that we were able to pull through was very, very relieving, especially after seeing my grandparents struggle really hard with, um, with the virus when they caught it, especially my grandfather who, uh, has emphysema and so was laid up for about three whole weeks. They pulled through and I, I feel like everyone is just a little bit better off because of the experience, <laughs> as scary as it was in the moment. Hi, this is Susan Smith-Peter again, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the theme of resilience. When I went through this project with several of my public history uh, classes, I was struck, as were the students, by the importance of the theme of resilience. And one of the things that kept on coming up again and again when it came to resilience was the importance of New York City to giving New Yorkers a sense of cohesion and a sense of being part of something larger than themselves. And you see it again and again in the pictures and the videos and the stories. One story, sadly not one that we collected, but an amazing one nonetheless, was collected by Craig Taylor in his book, New Yorkers, A City and Its People. And in that story, there's a guy, he's either working for sanitation or the MTA, I, I can't remember exactly, but he was very sick with the virus and he was in this place that was sort of between life and death. And in that limbo, he had an argument with the virus and he told the virus that it could never defeat him, it could never defeat New York, that New York was stronger than it and that New York would always come back. And of course he survived and he came back in order to be able to tell the story. And I feel that that is sort of where we are now with New York. I mean, New York survived. New York was stronger than the virus. There was a terrible toll. And unfortunately the virus did expose a lot of inequities that need to be dealt with and um, fixed. But overall, when you go into the city or here on Staten Island, uh, you're just struck, or at least I certainly am, by the way that it feels almost like before the pandemic. Uh, it's a bustling place. All those people who were saying New York is dead, they were clearly wrong. And I think that New York is uh, an extraordinary place 
starting from the epicenter, epicenter of the outbreak um, and going through to where we are now. I think that even though we were through some tough times, we went through them together. And so there are things to celebrate. And one of the things that I think is so important is to make sure that all of our stories are told. And so I would like to ask anybody here who would like to tell your story, please do submit it to our page, uh, which is part of Journal of the Plague Year. And there's a QR code at the end of this. Your story matters, Staten Island's story matters, and I think together we can tell the story of COVID-19 uh, in New York City in a way that just simply cannot be told if Staten Island is left out. So I hope to hear from you and I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.